Hi there, thank you so much for making time for the trading bell today. My name is Malika Kazia. We're actually at the entrance of the Reinsurance Plaza because we want to go upstairs and talk to the Chief Executive Officer of the Kenya Reinsurance Company, and that is Jadaya Mwaranya. Let's find out more about the numbers coming out of Kenya Ray that were actually released a few days ago. Also, where is the insurance sector in Kenya when it comes to COVID-19? Well, we'll find out this and so much more, but first, do take a look at his profile. Mr. Jadaya Mwaranya is the managing director of the Kenya Reinsurance Corporation Limited. He has worked with the corporation for over 25 years and was previously the general manager reinsurance operations and acting managing director. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce and Master of Business Administration from the University of Nairobi. He is a fellow of the Chartered Insurance Institute of London and the Insurance Institute of Kenya. He is currently pursuing a PhD in Strategic Management at the University of Nairobi. Mr. Morania is a chartered insurer of the Insurance Institute of London, the highest and most prestigious level of professional achievement with the Institute, and a fellow of the Kenya Institute of Management. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of Industrial Development Bank, ZEPRE, and the Chairman Executive Committee of the Association of Kenya Reinsurers. He is a board member of the Insurance Training and Education Trust Board and member of the Finance and Development Board Committee of the College of Insurance of Kenya. Mr. Moranya is a holder of the Order of Grand Warrior Award. So thank you so much for making time for us. Welcome. Let's begin with the numbers that you released, uh, I believe, a few days ago. We saw profit before tax actually soar compared to 2018. So for mm. 2019, the figure was about 4.18 billion before mm. tax, after tax about 3.9 billion. Um, you know, tell me a little bit more about how we arrived at these numbers in terms mm. of the factors that were surrounding it, especially given the economic situation. Yes, you're right about the economy. Uh, last year was a very challenging year in terms of the markets across Africa, actually I would say globally. Uh, when you look at the results or the profitability of our insurance company, it comes from two main streams, that is the gross return premiums and then the investment income. Now on the, on the reinsurance side, we had so many challenges which included the domestication of so many markets that we operate in. We saw under price undercutting is still an issue in many of our markets, uh, a lot of competition and so on. But as a corporation, we have a strategy, a strategic uh, plan that we implement. Uh, we, are, we would say that uh, we were quite particular about the way we implemented and we saw a growth in uh, gross return premiums of up to 18%, uh, which was a major contribution to the profit. Then on the investment side also, uh, we have the same strategy addresses issues to do with the investment. Uh, which we have detailed quite clearly in terms of selecting the investment products and uh, the timings of recreditating each, uh, some of them uh, and reinvesting. And again, we saw an increase of 10% growth mm. in the investment income. Now, it is a combined effect of these two, the investment income and the reinsurance premium, that actually saw to the 35% increase in profit before tax and actually 74% uh, after tax. Okay. Mm. When we talk about the dividend, um, we have seen that Canary seems to be holding back on the dividend payment. Uh, why is that the case? It's really, I wouldn't call it holding back. It's a policy. We have a dividend policy, which is uh, paying up to 30% of uh, the net profit after adjusting for certain uh, uh, items like non-cash items in the profit. Uh, the corporation uh, has been holding quite a bit of in terms of retained earnings and we see this as a growth strategy because these this same resources are used for, for growing. A quick example would be what happened last year when we issued the, the, sh the, the, the bonus shares and that was necessitated by our needing to increase our capital for purposes of penetrating certain markets or retaining our business in certain market, Egypt in this case. Uh, it, is, it is important also to realize that given the shareholding structure of the corporation and the very big diversity of the shareholders, uh, if there was a need for capital ejection, it would be very challenging to, to get uh, this capital ejection from the shareholders. So part of that retained earnings is, is really not holding back. It's an attempt to avail resources or capital for purposes of expansion. The company will for sure continue expanding, going into the future, into the markets and into the products that we are doing. That will call for more capital. And uh, uh, secondly, we also need to maintain our rating by AM Best. 
if you've looked at the rating drivers, uh, one of the key one is actually strong capitalization. Mm -hmm. And the retained earnings is counted as part of the uh, capital structure of the company. So again, to sustain a good rating by the rating agencies uh, for purposes of attracting new business to the company and ensuring the company grows, it is necessary to hold some of that. But we are not saying that uh, we don't pay dividends. We have paid dividends every year. Uh, and actually, if you look at the, 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 the policy, we've stuck to it, 30%, sometimes slightly more, has been paid. So it is, in, uh, it is actually the corporation's policy to pay dividends every year, and that includes this year. We'll pay 10 cents per share, but remember, these are now for every share held before last year, it became four shares. Mm. So we are actually saying it's 10 cents per share, but uh, it's actually 40 cents because of the duplication of the number of shares. Okay, mm. when we talk about um, additional 2 billion shares that were added last year, how has that impacted the business? Uh, first, like I've already mentioned, it uh, helped us in terms of increasing the capital uh, requirement, uh, requ uh, capital, uh, paid up capital from 1.7 billion up to 6.99, call it 7 billion. And that was very necessary for purposes of retaining our market share. Egypt was a case. We think the Maghreb area, Middle East, uh, they're going to follow the same trade, where they require a certain minimum capital for a company for you to be able to do business. So had we not done that, we would have lost business in, in, in Egypt. And if we had lost that, of course, the impact would have been direct in terms of reduced uh, growth in the gross uh, return premiums and gross profitability uh, at the end of the day. Profit would also have gone down. If it goes down, of course, what goes uh, get paid as dividends is also less. When we talk about um, Egypt, you've, you've, you've mentioned it a few times. What are your expansion plans there? And also uh, Uganda as well, because I've seen um, pretty much your offices set up there at the moment. You know, what, what's the progress on those expansion plans? The corporation's uh, strategy, one of the strategies, we have very many strategies for uh, expanding in the business. And this includes uh, uh, making uh, inroads into various markets using different strategies. One of the strategies has been to set up uh, subsidiaries. We started with the Côte d'Ivoire and we set up a, a subsidiary there. Uh, it's been uh, doing quite well. The, it's actually been there almost 10 years now. Then we went on to the southern part of Africa to, and we set up in Lusaka, Zambia. The idea was for that subsidiary to take care of the market in southern Africa, the same way that Côte d'Ivoire subsidiary is taking care of the Francophone West Africa. Then recently, last year, uh, we actually set up in Uganda. Uh, it's still in the process of finalizing the final bits in terms of setting up the office. And that subsidiary also was created purposely to protect or defend the business we have in Uganda, following domestication of business, uh, reinsurance business in Uganda. Now, going forward, we are still looking at markets, scouting for markets, doing feasibility studies. We've done some for Egypt, for Sudan, for Nigeria. And this is in preparation for future expansion. We don't think we should set up another one quite quickly, but uh, we need to start gathering information about where next to go. The mention of Egypt is just because Egypt was the first market in Africa to raise the capital requirements for foreign reinsurers working in their, uh, in, in their market, which means if you don't meet that threshold, then you don't do business. Mm -hmm. And Kenya Re was not meeting until last year. That's why we had to increase our capital. Okay, when we talk about the Kenyan market and the mandatory seeding of at least 20%, that is um, from the local insurers to the reinsurance um, firm, the law of course is set to expire December 31st and uh, you are looking to extend this? Uh, first of all, extension is not for us, it's for the government. Uh, what we've always tried to do to Kenya Re is to make it operate as a private company because we are actually competing in a private company market and space. We've tried to give customer service uh, the best that can be achieved or attained from any insurance company. So we don't really look at uh, mandatory sessions as the lifeline of the company. But yes, the mandatory sessions are there. Yes, they are meant to expire at the end of the year. The fate of what happens after that will depend on the government. Uh, but we also want to mention that uh, mandatory sessions is not in any way unique to Kenya. Re. Uh, in this market itself, we have two of our competitors who are getting compulsory sessions. One actually gets across the entire of Africa, another one gets um, in the Comesa area, which is about 20, 21 countries. And if you look at the companies which are being sent up, Uganda Re, 
for example, just set up the other day, a joy is 15 20% on both treaty and policy sessions. Tanzania, in Tanzania, we have Tanri, they enjoy the same mandatory sessions. It goes on and on. In India, GIC, enjoy the same. If you go to Sudan here, uh, not the Sudan, uh, uh, Sudan Reinsurance, National Reinsurance Company of Sudan gets up to 50%, and so on and so on. So, mandatory sessions is, is a model of business that was uh, adopted by a lot of countries, uh, companies, uh, especially those who were previously under the rule of the British. Uh, and uh, the objectives of this, I would say, were very noble. It is an attempt to try and retain premiums in the, in the countries of, of origin in terms of also building capacity. Uh, but like I said, it is not our focus. Our focus is to grow Kenya Re as a commercial entity, which is able to fight for business in the marketplace. And indeed, if you look at the proportion of, of the portfolio of the company, only about 30-34%, which is... Uh, coming from mandatory sessions. When we talk about some of the challenges in the insurance sector, I think undercutting of premiums has been something that many people have mentioned as a great challenge. What is your take on that? It is a reality. It's been there. Uh, we've done the best we can as reinsurers to try and discourage it. Uh, it is a fact that uh, undercutting is not uh, intelligent, it is not uh, smart to undercut. It is actually undercutting, the definition of, uh, the way I would like to look at undercutting is actually accepting a less uh, price than the product you're giving. And it is not sustainable in the fullness of time because uh, an economical rates would easily lead to a downward spiral in terms of performance of a company and even probably shut down. But it is a reality, it's because uh, of the great homogeneity in the products of reinsurance that, and insurance that uh, maybe some players find it easier to compete on the part of the price. It's a very short term measure, it is not sustainable, we don't encourage it, but it is there in the market and uh, as reinsurers uh, we've tried to encourage as much as we are able our citizens to charge what is economic rate. We also would appeal to the regulator to at ensure that companies uh, adhere to the minimum rates they have filed with the regulator. Okay. Um, coming back to the global situation right now with COVID-19, the pandemic that is gripping nations across the world, um, you know, when it comes to the World Health Organization coming out and saying that this is a pandemic, already insurance providers across the board do not cover that um, situation there. For <coughs> Kenya, where do we stand right now? Yeah, a lot of policies uh, may not have provisions for that and uh, coronavirus is, is real in terms of its impact and uh, implications to the global economy first, uh, of course to the Kenyan economy. We are seeing uh, quite a lot of stress is, is coming through and will come through financial markets. We would expect a suppressed GDP growth rates. Uh, a lot of nations incurring a lot of expenses and that's suppressing uh, growth. Now, in terms of reinsurance in Kenya, yes, the policies don't cover it and by extension the tr most treaties will not uh, cover it. But uh, a bit of debate or discussion is really needed on that issue because you have to balance uh, the interest of the, of the country and of course the interest of the shareholders. I've seen a quotation from one of the major players in Europe saying that uh, in U for the European context and even the world context that uh, corona should not be used, uh, reinsurance should not be used to be the solution for corona issues. Uh, but it's also a reality that uh, it's impacting. Now, in terms of direct impact on business, we can see uh, a reduction in probably gross return premiums mm. uh, because of course when the economy shrinks, the big uh, uh, growth rate shrinks, also the, uh, prof uh, premiums will be affected. We can almost certainly see an upsurge or uh, an increase in the kind of in claims. Uh, they may not be covered directly but there will be some indirect ones and so of course an uplift in, in, in claims and that if you combine these two factors you're actually talking of shrinkage in bottom lines and uh, therefore 2020 may actually not be as 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 well as good as 2019 has been 
So a lot of um, businesses, a lot of companies are, of course, looking at contingency plans and, of course, putting in place as much as possible the work from home, mm. um, you know, plan as the president also directed. Uh, as a company, have mm. you also managed to somehow, you know, uh, make sure that at least part of your staff is being able to work from home? Mm. Yeah, certainly, yes. Uh, half of the uh, company, we are about uh, 150 in terms of population of the of, of the company. About half of it, 75 or so, is is working from home. What we've done is that we've uh, crafted shifts where one group works uh, off at home and another one in the office, and then they, they rotate. The idea is to increase social distance within the office uh, by decongesting the offices and also avoiding a lot of movements, whether in public transport or in, in, in private cars, reducing the number of the interactions. We've taken also other many other measures in terms of trying to protect the staff. Uh, for example, uh, we've adhered to all the regulations and, uh, which have been churned out by government in terms of uh, circulars, where we've sanitized us all over the... We've sensitized staff. Uh, we keep giving communications in terms of how best to defend and uh, protect ourselves. In fact, we think now going forward, we'll actually enforce the issue of using masks because uh, as the cases are rising, the risk is also increasing. So to answer your question directly, yes, we have half of the staff working off the office and the other staff, the other half working in the office. Okay. Mm. And um, just given the progress of the pandemic, and like you said, you know, with the economic implications, um, as a company, are there any contingency plans in terms of the economic impact of this virus on the company itself? Yes, like I said, uh, one direct, uh, in terms of the business, one direct impact we might see is a shrinkage in the gross return premiums. Uh, which will also go with probably an increase in, in claims, which will directly affect the profitability. We also see an impact on the investment income, negative impact, because uh, of course investing activities are going to be reduced. And, uh, and uh, because of the measures we are taking also, you would expect operating costs to slightly go up, uh, because we have to provide for, for it. In including reduced productivity. Uh, truth be told, when people work off the office and when they work in the office, the pro levels of productivity is likely to be less. So if you combine all this, it's actually saying the company's um, uh, expected output uh, could be less. And so what we're doing is, uh, of course, to try and enforce the strategy, try and keep communicating among ourselves to reduce the negative impacts. And uh, whenever we see an opportunity, uh, which is quite difficult in this kind of an environment, then we take advantage of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And even as we wrap up, just your final word to shareholders of Kenya Ray and, um, you know, just your reassurance of perhaps what to expect in the future. Uh, shareholders, of course, uh, they are the owners of the company. Uh, the company works uh, very, very in a very focused manner, uh, following its five-year strategic plan, which we set up in 19, uh, 2017, going to 2021. We have seen a lot of the targets being achieved in this in this period. And what we will tell them is, uh, keep your investment in Kenya. It is actually uh, a company of the future, I would say. It is obvious that uh, the price at which the, the shares are trading is far below the fundamentals, which to me is, is like a capital savings for those who have invested in the company. Uh, it is always good to buy a stock when it is, it is at a lower price, as long as the fundamentals actually dictate the value of it is higher. Uh, because uh, if you look at the various sensitizations or visibility stands that are coming out, when you look at the global markets and uh, investment opportunities that have shrunk as much as possible in the European and the American world, uh, the, the, the stock of Kenya will certainly rise. And uh, in fact, one, one of the things we've heard from some of those who are looking for their shares is that they can't find it. So I would say the shareholders are, are fortunate to be holding the stake. I would encourage them to hold it and even increase it where possible. Uh, they can only benefit. For every year, the last 10 years, for example, uh, shareholders were paid a dividend, including this year. Last year, on top of the dividend, they also got uh, the, the bonus shares four out of everyone that held. So I think it's a company of the future to invest in. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.